Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Zanardi. First of all, let me uh, thank you all for the warm uh, welcome. Uh, it's just so great to, to have another opportunity to, to compete and perform. Um, first of all, with a, with a beautiful uh, racing beast like the M80s uh, in uh, Daytona at the Rolex 24, preparing for it, which has always been like one of my dreams, you know, to be part of uh, this event. Uh, which has a lot of history, but on top of everything, I kept hearing stories from mates, from colleagues, rivals, who were involved in the, in the cars in the mid-90s when I was competing, and uh, they had the opportunity uh, to participate. So I know that that as one of the things to do down the road whenever the opportunity would come. Well, I'm 52, so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, the opportunity made me wait a little, but finally uh, I have it, and it's, uh, it's great to be here. And, uh, well, what was the first time you ever drove uh, at Daytona? Was it uh, In the infield, recently? it was like three weeks ago. Wow. Uh, on the oval, it goes back to when uh, dinosaurs were going around in the bushes <laughs> off the circuit. Uh, I participate to the IROC Championship in uh, 1997. Uh, I started the race actually on pole position, not because I was the fastest, simply because I was drew <laughs> to start the race on pole position and did the last in front of the pack very long because I took the green flag leading the pack, never checked the throttle for the entire lap, but I found myself last at the end of lap one. What did I do wrong? Uh, it's, uh, uh, it was a different game in comparison to IndyCars, which yeah. is what I was doing at the time. Well, I mean, so you've just, you just came from there, and uh, what do you think? Well, the, the, the facility, it's intimidating, yeah. quite frankly, because uh, next to the size, it's the atmosphere that you breathe inside the circuit of Daytona that is very special. And... Uh, to be there in the last few days where all the competitors were there, all the cars, all the teams. It was uh, once more very special. You know, I've been around a long time, so you should say I'm kind of proved under this point of view, but in reality, prior than uh, being someone very lucky to have had the opportunity to turn his passion into a profession, uh, I am passionate for, uh, for, 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 for this world, for this, uh, uh, I'm a fan. And uh, for me to walk around and uh, be recognized by the fans, uh, by many old friends, receive more support than I was expecting, it, it was sincerely very special. Uh, it's something that you always say, but in my case it's really true. And uh, I felt, I have to say, a, quite little, quite small, because, you know, in spite of my age, I am indeed a rookie. Uh, everything is new to me, the circuit, the car, uh, the rhythms, the rules. Uh, I don't know many of the drivers. And, uh, I mean, the last thing I've been riding in the last 18 months was my end cycle, which is actually a front-wheel driven vehicle. <laughs> so well, it's quite different in so, comparison to this beast. <laughs> well, let's talk about how you g got back into endurance racing. So the first endurance racing you did, you were using uh, a My legs, yeah. Right. Well, in fact, it goes back to when I was first offered to drive a car after my accident, because the question was, Alex, what do you need? Yeah. And I said, well, I guess I have to do everything with my hands. Uh, but since the offer was to drive a BMW 320, with which Team BMW Italy was competing in the European Touring Car Championship, that car at the time had a H pattern gearbox. And so you can easily imagine how complicated it was co to control everything just out of my hands. So they, the engineers, they introduced a, 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 a power braking system that was activated with a sort of a ring underneath the steering wheel. Then I had another one to 
operate the throttle, then this hand had to be dedicating for downshifting, approaching the turns and operating the clutch. So since I had to blip the throttle, all, all I was left with uh, to steer the car into the turns was basically my palm. <clears throat> and that was tough. Yeah. So at the end of the first run, uh, I just turned to the engine and said, well, guys, if you give me a little sweeper, I'll hold it with my teeth. I clean the cockpit while I'm driving. It's the only <laughs> instrument I've got left, my mouth. And uh, that, was, that was a little too much. So we had a laugh. But when we went back to the shop, I suggested they should try to modify the brake pedal so we could trap my prosthetical foot onto it and I could, you know, press down with my hip in order to generate the pressure it takes to slow the car down. They were a little reluctant. They said, no, we don't have power brakes in this car. You need to generate really almost 100 kilos worth of pressure, which is what, like 200 pounds plus. So to win their skepticism, I went back home. I brought back to the shop the ohm scale that you normally use to check your weight every morning. I put it up against the wall. I pressed, actually I had first the engineer, the chief engineer, to do this, and all he could reach was like 90 kilos, which is, what, 200 pounds. Then I said, it's my turn. So I went, 220. <laughs> I said, is that enough? Wow! I didn't think you could press that hard. So they went on to develop that, that but that was just for the sake of having yeah. You know, a blast one afternoon uh, in, in testing. BMW Italy was nice enough to offer me to do this. But when we took that solution to the circuit, we realized, I realized that the feel I had on the pedal was exceptional. That I could really, with that solution being optimized a little, I could really probably approach the limit and, and drive the car well. So we developed it a little more and then it was no time, basically, when I got involved back into racing full-time, uh, driving in what became World Touring Car Championship at WTCC. And one year later, basically, in Oschersleben in Germany, which geographically is the closest, let's say, place to Lautzisring, which is where I had my accident, I ended up winning the race. And that was a very special moment. I gotta admit, uh, because I never um, doubt that down the road I could win a race. Uh, I wouldn't have done it otherwise, but to finally do it, to see once more all my opponents in the rear mirrors, it was special. And especially when I stepped on the podium and I see, saw the reaction of all the people there, I really got something uh, that goes far beyond racing, accomplishments, uh, doing well, serving to the best of my ability, BMW, and I was very, very proud of that. How much of coming back, getting back in the race car and racing again, how much of it was you overcoming physical challenge and how much was it convincing uh, race organizers that uh, that you were, you know, it was safe for you to actually race. Well, you guys understood already that to be synthetical is not my best quality. Yeah? The question was about the brake pedal and I started from... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to answer this one, uh, you're right, it was not easy. Not because people didn't want me to be involved again in racing. Actually, everybody couldn't be happier, but in reality they were scared you always fear what you don't understand. And so a lot of people were afraid that I would have another accident and I would hurt myself. And in reality, it's just because they saw me as being more vulnerable than others. I'm not any more vulnerable. I mean, if I break one of my legs, it only takes a four millimeter screw and I fix it, you know, I change it. <laughs> Whether for you would be much more complicated, you know? Uh, but that's the way it is. And uh, people were afraid that if I would have an accident, I could hurt somebody else. I remember when I went through my medical check to get my license, boy, I had a commission of 20 doctors, and they were just looking for an excuse to say, 
I'm sorry, you can't do it. And uh, they scanned my head. I said, hey, guys, I lost my legs. I didn't lose my head in the accident. <laughs> but uh, luckily, I had a great company like BMW uh, backing me up, interested in, uh, you know, executing this project. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I never took this for granted because they, I mean, yes, it's extra exposure, so for sure it's always nice, but BMW doesn't really need this, right? Uh, they were just interested in doing something which uh, goes beyond uh, their capability uh, to prove how uh, technologically advanced are their methods how their cars, what they do, what they deliver. It's about human beings. It's about serving. It's about understanding that technology can give you great answer, but it's us as human beings who are capable of making the questions. Computers cannot make questions, you know? So uh, to cut a long story short, that was an interesting project for them. I was able evidently to come up with the right wording in convincing them that I could do this, and uh, the rest is history. Here we are, you know, it's been on a long route, but I believe that with what we've done, we have enabled other people to have a better opportunity uh, to be, uh, to, to, to face uh, whoever could give them or not the green light to, to have a rational approach and say, okay, let me judge what, what, what your plan is. I mean, for instance, a guy like Frédéric Sosset drove Le Mans two years ago, and he has a, a amputation both at his legs and in his arms. I don't think prior to our venue, FIA would have ever consider even just having a look at what he had to say, you know? And now, there you go, Billy Munger. He had an accident, he has a double amputation in his legs. And all they want to know these days, whenever he shows up for a job, is how good you are, you know, as a driver. They don't care about, uh, you know, what his disability is, because they know that this can be overcome with some particular solutions. And with the set of controls we have now in this car, uh, actually, we have entered into a new dimension because these new controls are actually compatible with other people's needs. I mean, anybody who has good arms but cannot use his legs could probably drive this car and probably even better than than me because I'm not that talented, you know? <laughs> wow, you're pretty talented. Um, so we have this uh, steering wheel right in front. So um, can you sort of walk us through the, the different parts of yeah. how you're able to control it? Well, first of all, why? Because okay. 2015, Spa, 24 hours, I drove alongside uh, Timo Glock and Bruno Spengler, and I was still using the original solution of the brake pedal that I would press with my leg. But the socket, they basically trapped my wounds into a, a, a plastic surrounding, which is, uh, stops transpiration, increase the body temperature. Uh, basically, our limbs are the cooler of our body. We tend to lose temperature through the extremities. So I'm like an engine without a cooler, you know, especially when I have my legs trapped into the prosthetical sockets. For me, it's very, very hard to, to dissipate temperature. In the video you just saw, you probably saw me steaming when I came out of the car. I was baked. That, in, in that moment, I had just done a double stint in the middle of the night, and I was really done. That was it. Whether right now, if the rule would allow, I could drive the 24-hour race on my own, because uh, without uh, the prosthetic legs fitted, I mean, I'm very comfortable in the car. For sure, it's a little more complicated to deal uh, all the things that I have to do just with my hands, but physically speaking, it's really night and day. So, after that race, uh, the engineers, they came to me and they said, what do we need to do to make you a better driver? And I said, you need to study a set of 
uh, aids, uh, which would enable me to drive the car without my prosthetic leg. So here we are, basically, uh, what they have done, uh, this very complicated piece of equipment is my steering wheel. As you can see, I have a lot of switches, triggers, uh, uh, controls. This car is probably by far the most complicated machine I've ever driven in my racing career. It has so many um, functions uh, that can be controlled electronically, uh, which enables the driver to, you know, uh, make and change the behavior of the car through the runs as the tires, wears, and so on. So this all is going to be very, very important, but this is what every driver has. As you can see, I have this mechanism which uh, enables me to power the car, is the throttle mechanism. And uh, you may notice that it's pretty asymmetrical because I always use my left hand uh, for the majority of the time to operate the throttle. So when I steer right, it's not a problem to reach the throttle mechanism, but when I steer left, it would be basically impossible to do so. So we have developed this sort of horn where I can change grip, and like this, it's not a problem to operate the throttle. Now you say, wow, this is a pretty smart idea. And I think it is, because uh, we never tested. We just had a very, very long meeting in Munich where we said, what do we need? Everything was uh, put over the table. We discussed for an entire afternoon. We walk away with an agreement. And three weeks later, I went up to Munich, and all these ideas were reality. And everything works. And it's amazing, you know? So I think this is really like winning a race, you know? Yeah. To, 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 uh, to be into a meeting with uh, 10 very smart engineers. Um, I mean, it takes the skill, it takes the effort, but more than everything, it takes the passion because you can pay people as much as you want, uh, but they're only going to bring work home whenever they go back to their family if they're passionate for what they do. And I believe that these guys kept thinking, how can we do this better? How can we do this? How can we do that? So this is, for instance, uh, the result of a lot of dedication, of a lot of passion, on top of a lot of knowledge. <laughs> and, uh, okay, uh, this is the butterfly that uh, allows me to go through the gears. With this, I do the upshift by pushing. This way, I can also downshift. But this end is normally quite busy, approaching every turn, uh, uh, operating the, the brake lever. So on the top of the brake lever, we have a second electronical, let's say, trigger with which I can do the downshifting. So I, we actually have a video of that. You, you did a video you? Uh, around uh, Daytona, I believe. Okay, we approaching turn one, which is a very, very difficult corner, especially for me, not knowing the circuit was hard at the beginning because you don't break in a straight line. You have to break and approach the turn, uh, which is like a double ender. And, uh, you know, braking, downshifting, and making sure that the car doesn't spin sideways is hard. Then you approach turn two. Again, difficult place to you know, to, to judge the right braking point, and then uh, you want to make sure that you hit the apex uh, by turning at the right moment. And again, downshifting and uh, turning, it's not that easy. The kink, it's uh, pretty easy flat, and then uh, here you approach turn four, where once more, uh, it's very easy to overshoot the braking point and get sideways, and while all this is happening uh, with only one wheel, only one end on the wheel, it's hard. Uh, Turn five, I like this a lot. Uh, it's a corner where you have to let go quite uh, early and, and roll the car into the corner with a lot of speed, which will then launch you uh, more rapidly towards uh, this long straight. Although you kind of turning around this banking, uh, yeah, we consider this as a straight line and you reach a pretty reasonable top speed uh, up before uh, the bus of chicane. 
this was the corner where I was having most of my problems. And uh, it's very, very hard for me uh, to brake efficiently, to turn the car in uh, without losing the back, without uh, uh, losing too much speed. You have to, to let the car roll in into the corner in order to have the speed uh, when you go back on the power to accelerate as, you know, after the corner, it leads you to that uh, long, long straight line where you have to try to develop uh, all the speeds you can to produce the best possible lap time. Uh, maybe the last question uh, that is left to be answered is how do I start uh, as far as the clutch? I have a centrifugal clutch, which is really the cat's meow. It's, uh, <laughs> it works very well. Um, I had a mini bike with just, a centrifugal clutch. You just clutch. gas it and the car takes off. And uh, <laughs> it's impossible to stall the engine because uh, you know, it always saves you in these situations where you may have to brake and uh, you lose grip on, on the throttle mechanism. So it's... Well, what's, uh, I, you know, this is a, kind of the obvious question is, but what is the hardest part of doing it? I mean, I'm going to throw out a couple of things. Muscle memory, is that a hard thing to not have or to, or to develop the muscle memory? And how important is muscle memory in racing? And is it, is it just not an issue for you? Um, yeah, especially because when you think you have memorized the, the right procedure, then over they come on the radio and tell you to change something, to reset a particular button, or to uh, change a particular function to a different figure. And boy, it's difficult because, again, you only have 10 fingers, right? This, this end is busy doing something. This one, every few seconds, has to shift gear. But meanwhile, why you're counting like one, two, three, now it's time. The other, the tongue, has to go and reach a button and do something else. <laughs> and uh, I feel a little bit like uh, I said Jimi Hendrix. Uh, <laughs> let's just be humble and say a guitarist, uh, not, not the best one of all. Uh, but you really have to have... Uh, let's say, a certain amount of independency between one finger and the other, because again, you gotta try to take advantage of the fact that, again, as I said, you have 10 different fingers, and, uh, and it is technically possible, but it's, of course, quite difficult. <laughs> Luckily, Daytona has pretty long straight lines, so at times, I have the opportunity to also put my sight on what I'm doing, because <laughs> everything is basically new. I mean. I am currently uh, discovering the car. I mean, I, I drove it for the first time a few weeks ago in the test. Uh, yeah, it's not easy, but again, it's not impossible. I want to believe I'm a fast learner. Um, and I have uh, a great team. I'm part of a great team, Team BMW RLL uh, with their drivers. Uh, both cars, but in particular on my side. Uh, well, what are the athletic challenges? Because, I mean, you know, you, you know, you've been in the Paralympics, you're a gold medalist. How do you retrain your body to do something that it wasn't particularly designed to do? To drive a race car these days, it is physical. Believe me, guys, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, ever been to a circuit pushing the car to the limit. Even with road tires, uh, you know, you take your crash helmet off and you're completely sweat. And it's normal, it's hard, it's difficult. Uh, you're talking about a racing machine which is capable of producing some incredible lateral forces, longitudinal forces, whenever you decelerate, reaccelerate. So this all, it's a multiplier of, uh, you know, of the, 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 uh, the effort that you have to, to put in just steering the car and applying the pressure in dealing with all you have to do. So it is a physical sport, but for sure, covering the distance of an Ironman, it's harder. Uh, 
with all the due respect, you know, <laughs> or winning a race uh, in, in paracycling, which is a sport where the level has grown to a point that nobody would ever believe. Uh, often, uh, we are faster than uh, normal cyclists. I mean, just to give you an idea, I participate to this Ironman in Italy, which is a very prestigious one, out of 3,000 athletes, able-bodied athletes, who were competing into the event, I finished uh, fifth overall. Uh, and I was the only disabled, basically, that day in the field. So this means that, uh, you know, I am physically trained, probably, as I've never been before in my, in my racing career. So, of course, when I, when I jump into the car, it's a hell of a starting point, right? Then you may have to do something more specific to train for the effort uh, you do in, in this machine specifically. For instance, uh, I, I just run the car in Daytona the last three days, and my muscles are a little sore just because to do this movement once, it's so light that it's not a problem, but to do this movement thousands of times, although the throttle mechanism is very light, for a muscle, or for muscles like these ones that are not trained to do this, yeah, I'm a little sore. Um, so there are some things that uh, could be made better, but for sure this is not my main concern. My main concern is more to learn the car, more to get up to speed, and uh, on, on all it takes to be aware of what you're doing while you're driving. It's a long race, a lot of things are going to happen. Uh, you wanna know also when they go full course yellow, for instance, what the rules are. Uh, you wanna know how to behave, not to waste any time, how to park your car when the pit lane is crowded, uh, how to avoid troubles, and this all, is uh, stuff that I will have to learn on top of developing, uh, you know, my driving technique in order to, to deliver the best possible performance. You have to not only learn all of this stuff, physically you have to, you know, master all of the physical challenges of it. But at the end of the day, you're racing a car, right? I mean, and you want to be the, you, you want to be the fastest guy out there. When do you, I, I, I don't even know if there's a question in here, but the question that I'm trying to ask is something like, at what point does, does you, all of that stuff come together and all you're doing is thinking about driving the car again? Well, that moment <coughs> never comes in reality. And this is probably my greatest talent, to always feel not sufficiently prepared. This has always been my greatest talent. This is how I, earn my nickname, Pineapple. Uh, uh, 1996, uh, I had this great relationship with my race engineer who was also serving as a technical director at Genesee. And he, you know, uh, we got on really well because I'm, a, I'm very passionate for developing the car. I'm never happy with the car uh, until you always have one minute before the race starts, it's always an opportunity to make that last change in the setup to make the car perform better. Then when the race goes, well, it's that you have what you have and you have to adapt if you have problems and you have to also drive the car to go around the problems. And I think I can do that too. But again, uh, I can only be myself and, and I've always been very passionate for this up to the point where sometimes Morris would say, come on, Pineapple, shut up, we gotta go racing. <laughs> pineapple for him was a way to describe a stubborn kid which is never happy with what he has. And one night, I was already back at the hotel under the shower and I had this bright idea, so I went back to the circuit and I described it, so they were all laughing at me. But then he started to pick the geniality on what I was suggesting, and he got really mad at me. And he said, listen, Pineapple, you can't come here at 10.30 in the night and expect the boys to tear the car apart and to stay here until 3 o'clock in the morning. Tomorrow, you drive the car the way it is, 
And then after session one, I will change all the roles, the bloody roll center you want to change in the front <laughs> suspension. That was it. So he walked away and I found some uh, markers. So I drew a pineapple on my helmet to actually pull his legs back. And the following day we had a laugh and I kept it for the rest of the weekend. And I went on to win my very first IndyCar race. And so it became my lucky charm from that point onwards. So to synthetically answer your question, about an hour later, uh, that's the way I feel. I have time. I have a great opportunity with my teammates who are incredibly talented, like John Edwards, Jesse Cron, Chaz Moster, and an incredible uh, group of people in BMW Team RLL who all can be, can support me, can teach me things. So I need to absorb as much as I can until the light goes green. And then I will be on my own dealing with what I have to deal. Uh, counting on the experience that I've grown, uh, which can be the multiplier of my talent, which has never been, it won't be, uh, the best of all. I've never felt uh, I was the best driver of all. I always felt sufficiently talented to steer the wheel and win races with the right equipment at every level, and by winning races at every level, I think I proved that to myself, so I hope I will prove that to myself once more uh, in a uh, in few weeks' time. Uh, I know you've talked about this a million times, but I, I, I have to ask you about the past. When was, the, so, <laughs> because I heard, I heard the word Zanardi line the first time I went to Laguna Seca, and they, it, they, they prefaced it by saying, don't do the Zanardi line. <laughs> so I want to know what, like what, I, I mean, I, I, we don't have the, vi the video of it actually happening, but so what was happening as that happened? I don't even, that's a terrible st structured okay. sentence, but. Th Facts. I was leading the race. Uh, I had a blister. Um, so Brian Erta got up on me, passed me. And then uh, next pit stop with a fresh set of tire, I caught him back and I was stuck there because I was faster than him. But Laguna, Laguna Seca is a place where it's very difficult to overtake somebody unless you are like a second, second and a half faster than the guy in front. So I was waiting for my opportunity. I was hoping he would make a mistake, but uh, it was not. It was just driving beautifully. It was keeping the car on the on the line, lap after lap. So I start to develop that diabolical plan, <laughs> where if on the last lap Brian would ease a little bit uh, after he had gone around turn five, which is the last place where you can decently overtake somebody. Um, yeah, maybe something that is normally not possible would become possible. And, and so I was just ready to go for it. I swear to God, I had that plan in my mind. Now, I have to admit that uh, the execution uh, was slightly different than what I had forecasted <laughs> because I planned to keep my four wheels on, on, on the asphalt and uh, Boy, I mean, I jumped and I got really scared. In Italy, we say I, co I saw the only mother crossing my road on a bicycle. Uh, and that was definitely the case, but I managed to, to regain control of the car. He didn't take advantage because I had a moment where I was kind of a sitting duck with the car going everywhere but where I wanted. And uh, that's it. Next, uh, it's, uh, you know, Alex, you're the man. Alex, you've done the greatest <laughs> overtaking of all. And uh, the difference... <laughs> yeah, I mean... The difference between being a hero or an idiot, uh, <laughs> it's quite small, but luckily for me, I managed to stay underneath that line. <laughs> uh, so, and the racing controllers were fine with that line. The, you, you, I mean, it was, it was good, and it was a good pass, and, uh, and you won. I just to, just to put a cap on it, really. Uh, 
it's difficult to comment because uh, that that past changed my entire racing career. I have to be honest. I was lucky. Uh, I made other overtaking maneuvers uh, where talent involved uh, played a much greater role, like in Long Beach in '98, uh, passing once more Brian Herta with two laps to go into a place where nobody had ever thought trying to an overtaking maneuver, passing Michael Andretti in Toronto on the last lap, and you couldn't stick a $10 bill in between my right wheels and the wall and my left re wheels and his wheels. Uh, but I managed to find that, that room. Yeah, Laguna I was lucky, but again, uh, the comment of Wally Dollenbach, who was the chief steward in those days, he, he said, you had him completely before going off, and when you, when you went off, you lost time. And uh, he should have took advantage of that. He could have had you back right then. He didn't take advantage, so you did a hell of a move in my, in my book. And that was that, because uh, at the time, rules were the same, but were applied in a completely different way. Um, whether this is right or wrong is not up to me to say. These days, rules are these, and you go this much beyond the line, you're out. That's it. Maybe this is just, no doubt, but take Formula One, for instance. Sometime, they make a slight contact and they get penalized. And this takes away the will of the drivers to try something different. So it's always a give and take situation. Uh, you can't have uh, uh, the barrel full in Italy. We said the barrel full and your wife drunk. Uh, <laughs> you have to decide what you want to do. But those days were different and that type of stuff was accepted because I was not that was not a single episode, completely different than many other ones, you know. That is uh, remembered because it was the last lap of the last race uh, in a very particular situation. TV Live uh, captured the action and, uh, yeah, and uh, luckily you could see, you could look at me as the hero or the villain, but I'm the one that certainly won the race. It's as simple <laughs> as this. So I'm not checking my watch because I don't want you to keep talking, because I do. Uh, but I, 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 we, we're going to have to sort of eventually, you know, get to the end of this. <laughs> Which I don't really want to, but I, let me let me ask you another thing though. Um, Daytona, did you have an opportunity to do any other race? I mean, I, I'm, I'm asking you a leading question because I I heard something that you said to Marshall Pruitt on his podcast, where you could have raced Le Mans or Daytona, and you chose Daytona. Uh, is that accurate? First and second, why? What I can say is that. Uh when the idea was uh, brought up for the very first time with Jens Marwer, who is uh, the director of the, uh, all the projects at uh, Motorsports in, uh, in Munich and around the world uh, for BMW, uh, he said, Alex, if ever we get you involved with the, with the MA, they were just about to launch the project, uh, would you be interested in racing, I don't know, maybe either Daytona or how about Le Mans? <laughs> he thought probably that I would say, yeah, wow, Le Mans being European. But in reality, uh, don't get me wrong, it's a great event. But especially these days, it's much more a technical exercise among the engineers in delivering, uh, you know, the best possible car. As a driver, you don't have much to do down the straight line where you go like, <laughs> Uh, Daytona is by far more exciting. There's much more driving involved with what you do. And on top of everything, I don't want to sound 
disrespectful because I am Italian. But boys, guys, this is my land. Here is where I was able to get my opportunity. And I thank you all for the support you giving to the sport. And directly or indirectly, you've been giving to me in turning my passion into a profession. But I was nobody when Chip hired me. And when I start to drive in Indy cars, I, I said in the video, I came with a bag full of hopes. And I went back with a bag filled with many other things. And it's not necessarily money, but it's you know, the possibility to do something that it's what keeps me alive. Whenever I drive a car like this one and I go through the gears and I feel I'm taking the car to the limit, I see the lights uh, indicated that I'm almost locking the front wheels going like doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> and boy, it's, uh, it's a fantastic feeling. And, uh, and, uh, and so having said this all, I'm so pleased to be here in, uh, in, in, in the United States once more to race in front of the fans who changed my life with their support. And I heard so much about Daytona, the Rolex 24, from maids, rivals, people who were involved with this event at any level. So, yeah, I mean, when, when Jens said, would you, would you prefer Daytona or Le Mans? I said, Daytona, forget Le Mans. I want to go to Daytona, and here we are. So again, uh, it was great, uh, the, 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 the atmosphere inside the paddock. I want to thank all the people at IMSA for being so supportive, and, uh, and uh, some of the people who work for IMSA were in my crew back at the Ganassi days, and it's nice to see that they have developed such a fantastic individually fantastic professional career and uh, and again you know to be into a paddock where I have a lot of friends people who are busy doing their own stuff so we won't have time to go out for dinner but uh, but it's nice to know that we are all there once more I am back in, in, in into the same field and, uh, and I can't wait to go back for the race and uh, and uh, harder also it's just metaphorically speaking, uh, as many fans as I can, and hopefully, you know, uh, I will be able to 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 display my performance together with my team and uh, have a big smile on my face when when it's over. Well, it's fantastic to have you back, and I can't wait for Daytona coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, Alex and Ari, thank you so much. Thank you.